and uh, welcome to the uh, Town Hall Forum, sponsored by Open Victoria Initiative Society. Uh, we're here to discuss transparency, accountability, and openness uh, in uh, Victoria and the CRD, how to preserve it. I just say that, uh, you know, it's 23 degrees outside, <laughs> a wonderful sunshine evening, we have been very happy to discuss TA, or I would say you're either very committed, or you should be. <laughs> That's it. We have a wonderful panel here tonight that encompasses all aspects of uh, that issue, and I'm really looking forward myself to hearing a great discussion on this. And your questions and observations are certainly welcome. Um, I have to get a plug in uh, for uh, Open Victoria. Uh, we are a non-profit society. I do mean non-profit. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's basically funded by ourselves at the moment, you know, with uh, the help of some donations that we get from doing events like this. Uh, or the last one was 2011 when we held the sewage uh, So we would appreciate your donation uh, either now or later. And to make it more fun, um, I got an idea. How many people here have heard uh, David Flegger be on uh, CPAC this morning? Okay, well you can't take part in this conference. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, Alright, well David quoted something uh, this morning that uh, this may be loud, loud, loud. Uh, that would be uh, fun to, to have a contest around it. So, I'm going to ask you, which Canadian political leader said Freedom of information is making democratic government impossible. <laughs> Was it Stephen Harper, Mike Harris, Ralph Klein, Gordon Campbell, or Glenn Clark? Okay. Just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. I'll leave the question on the donation box back there. There are uh, blank cards here to write your answer on it, and your name and phone number. And we'll draw the winner uh, at the end for a nice uh, bottle of uh, French red wine. <laughs> the exact quote is Freedom of Information is Undermining Democracy. <laughs> oh, British Columbia, that's the trick. Oh. Oh. Give it away. <laughs> See, I'm only a journalist, so I don't know how to go to Mac. <laughs> All right, let's get at it. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Cawson as your moderator. Chris, you will know as a former mayor of Oak Bay and now as an Inner Harbor captain and uh, having a much uh, easier life at the time and more enjoyable. But he's also being a former mayor. An expert on this topic. So, Chris, if you will, take it away. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. So, thank, thanks very much, Terry. In the old days, the, uh, the mic was at the right height for a small man. Um, for those of you who came a bit early, you, you probably noticed that uh, that was probably the most exciting part of the evening, watching, watching Ross do high tech and get this over here in his shorts, so um, that was the kickoff, and uh, this obviously is, is an evening where we're going to talk about uh, open and transparent and democratic government, uh, and for those of you who wonder, yes, um, as a ferry captain, I am involved in open and transparent, just because I tell stories every day, and I always like it when tell stories going up the gorge throughout the history of, of Victoria and uh, people get off my boat and they say that was incredible. I never knew so much different history about Victoria. And I say come back tomorrow it will be completely different. So, <laughs> there are always stories to tell. We are very lucky to have um, a panel here tonight that um, has a broad uh, experience in the subject in which we are going to be talking. Every one of the panelists is going to be spending about five to six minutes um, on the subject. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they've drawn uh, a huge sort of drawer as to who's going to speak first and who's going to speak last. 
and there's absolutely no, no rhyme or reason as to how it was chosen, other than someone said, I want to speak first, and someone said, I like to speak last. So that's, that's the way it's been put together. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing the panelists. I'm just going to say who they are and their former position. Uh, I would, have, however, before I start, like to acknowledge, because I always think that, uh, we should acknowledge anyone in the audience who sits in government at the same time, and I apologize if I've missed anyone else, so I'm sure you'll tell me. But I do see Shelley Gudgeon, who's a councillor in the city of Victoria, sitting back there, and I, on behalf of, of everyone here, appreciate that you've turned up tonight, so thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dan, and I apologize for overlooking, but that's going to show how low profile school board trustees sometimes are, so thanks, and thanks for being here, really appreciate it. Okay, with no further ado, we'll ask uh, David Farrell, the former BC uh, Privacy and Information Commissioner, to uh, sit on the table. <laughs> um, is that table okay? This one, yeah. Okay. I think I can manage to speak to a room this size. If you can hear me, I'll go and use the microphone. I've got a piece of paper in front of me, so you'll think I have some prepared notes of some sort. I don't particularly. I realized, as I said to the gentleman sitting next to me, that I've been working on privacy protection for 50 years as of this year. I'd actually prefer to talk about privacy today, not least because Glenn Greenwell published his book, No Place to Hide, Edward Snowden, the National Security Administration and the U.S. Surveillance State. And I'm one of those people who regards Edward Snowden as a hero for what he's done. I'm absolutely disgusted. <laughs> absolutely disgusted that there's been no debate in Canada about the extent to which we're in the surveillance society. So if anybody wants to ask or make comments about privacy issues tonight, I'm happy to accommodate them, as I'm sure the rest of the panelists would be. I think I'm a preacher for privacy, and I'm a preacher for open government, accountable, transparent government. I have been for a long, long time. Murray Rankin and I didn't invite, invent freedom of information in Canada, but in the mid to late 1970s, we certainly began working on those kinds of issues with relative success. And once we thought we got laws starting in 1982 federally, we thought it was going to make a great deal of difference. Now, in the old overall scheme of things, the glass is half full rather than half empty. It is good to have legislation, as we've had in British Columbia since 1993, applied to the uh, municipal government thing from 1995 on. It's better to have them than not. But I'm absolutely disgusted that the people who run local government, the provincial government, the federal government, have been become so secretive and so controlling and so opposed to open, accountable, democratic, transparent government. Mm -hmm. It's a real tragedy, in my view, that that is the case. And I don't understand it. I really don't. I'm going to ask Chris later how secretive he was, was as the mayor of Oak Bay. I do know that people think that knowledge equals power, and controlling information, controlling general information, makes you powerful. You don't have to let the common people know what's going on. You don't need to know, let people know what the blue bridge is going to cost. I was joking with Leslie when she came in here with David Broadland that I think the whole purpose of FOI in Victoria is to give them something to write about in Focus magazine. Because <laughs> <laughs> every issue is full of FOI and it's highly entertaining, but they have to really stress to find out about it. And the people who are running these operations, whether political or, or public servants, they have to know the story is going to come out someday. They can't keep it secret forever. I was at a retirement party for a former preview of this province and he said, I made sure when I was briefing my deputy ministers and bureaucrats, they didn't write anything down. And another senior deputy minister said, yeah, and as soon as he went out of the room, we wrote everything down. <laughs> because they were covering their own asses. So that one of the great solutions in this day and age is don't keep records. I've heard politicians at the most senior level in this country say they sit down with a piece of paper and make some decisions. But at the end of the day, those decisions have to be fed into the bureaucracy. There needs to be a paper trail. There needs to be rationality. There needs to be empirical data brought to bear on, on the situation. So I'm not going to say much more than we all have to keep pushing for open, democratic, transparent, accountable government. 
I think Open Victoria is a wonderful initiative, as I said earlier today on the, on the radio. And I really admire the fact that young people are coming around along, and everybody in the room is younger than I am, I think, and to promote these kinds of values and try to make these things work. And of all kinds of, of gimmicks, I saw on the Open Victoria website, all kinds of bright ideas they have to remind you when your garbage pick up of, and you know, new, use social media or technology to help you find out what things cost, what they should cost, what's going to happen when. So I simply want to make those mildly principled points and um, encourage you to keep supporting them. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. A good way to kick off. David said he wanted to speak first because he was the eldest. So thanks, David. Uh, Leslie. Um, Leslie Campbell. Everyone knows Leslie Campbell as editor and founder of Focus Magazine. Uh, one of the great reads in Victoria. Leslie. Can everybody hear me? Because I'm not getting flat yet. I'm going to sit up on the edge of the table. I'm a writer and not a public speaker, so bear with me as I um, take you through some of our adventures with freedom of information and transparency. Um, I guess it was about 10 years ago that focus shifted from being a women's magazine to a city magazine. And then, but it wasn't really until about five years ago with the infrastructure was the bridge pro project coming along up to, um, with the bridge project uh, starting that we started doing what I would call investigative reporting in a big way. And David in particular, who's here tonight and may help me out occasionally, um, he um, and I have learned so much through our adventures in investigating uh, that infrastructure project and of course since then we've We've got into the um, sewage debate and uh, uh, even looked at LNG projects because these infrastructure projects are, um, they sort of take you into all aspects of local government. Um, so right from uh, the myths and realities around public engagement, uh, the bid pro process, uh, high price consultants, the decisions made behind closed doors, the roles of council versus the roles of staff and so on. So it's been a great educational experience for both David and I and the lessons are, like I said, proving useful in other ways. Um, one of the things we've discovered over the past five years though, and it's sort of relevant to um, the upcoming election, which was one of the sort of reasons I think that Open Victoria decided to um, host this, um, is that the city councillors are often seem to be left in the dark about information that we find out. Um, sometimes it's budget related information, sometimes it's about the design of very key aspects of the bridge, say. Um, and uh, sometimes it's just a doc a report that might have helped them understand uh, some, of the, some of the factors around the decisions they were making useful and relevant information. Um, unfortunately, by the time they, that we find out about it and report it, it's, it's not uh, generally very influential, although it might get some, some uh, attention from the public. So, in terms of the election and, and how, how we can uh, approach candidates and their promises of transparency, I think that is a, a question to sort of keep in mind like what, um, when they claim to be committed to transparency, how, how can they, um, how can they make that a reality? Because um, quite often they don't know what they don't know. So it yeah. sort of sounds like Rumsfeld, I guess, but, um, <laughs> but it makes sense, right? They don't, they don't know what they don't know, so um, how can they, um, know how to make it more transparent. So that's something maybe we can discuss in the Q&A. What I do know is that the odds for transparency are, and I think David Flaherty just alluded to this, they're much more favorable if a lot of us demand it um, and we get ourselves involved in information gathering, digging for the truth through things like FOI, supporting the organizations that are doing it, the uh, Open Victoria, and the Open um, Data Society. 
Um, so my main message tonight is that we all have a role to play in that regard. At the local level, Focus has experienced a tendency um, towards secrecy. And David came out very strong on this, so I won't uh, pull my punches either. Um, it plays out through far too many closed meetings. Um, decisions are made behind the scenes by steering committees. Um, it plays out in corporate-like communication strategies, whereby no city employee can talk to the media. Everything has to go through the communications director. We've also seen it in their response to um, our access to information requests via the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act. That is, government bodies have developed a bureaucracy, one that includes lawyers, that is skilled in protecting the municipal body from prime citizens. Delays, redactions, outrageous fees attached to uh, our FOI requests in the past, uh, denial, that any such records exist on the subject when you know they must have or you know it had to feed into their decision making. Um, a couple of years ago the city even stooped to using a little used totally inappropriate section of the act to for at least a while deny us all access through freedom of information. Uh, that uh, they did withdraw that section 43, as it was called, just before it went to a hearing. Which is, you know, it, there's a whole ploy around that stuff that uh, David can talk about more, or I can talk about more. Um, so, our fair city, like other government bodies, has um, what's been called a tendency to despotic secrecy by no less than the Supreme Court Justice Beverly McLaughlin. All governments have it, she says. So what we have to do as a society, as citizens, is to exercise muscles for transparency and force the city and other bodies, CRD, to exercise those same muscles. Um, the other thing to note um, is that in a democracy, information management is a government's main strategy for setting the agenda and manufacturing consent. Right now, at the local level, um, it, is a, it seems a, an especially critical time for many citizens to understand this and to use the checks and balances that do exist to combat these tendencies. Um, this is an era of huge infrastructure projects, especially at the municipal level, which is the least resources to pay for them. So like it or not, we do have to replace bridges, we do have to figure out a way to deal with our sewage, um, replace fire halls, roads, transit systems, you name it. So there are big dollars at stake and all of it comes from the taxpayers, even when you get a federal government grant or, a, or money kicked in by the province, it's all taxpayers that are paying for it. Um, studies show that 9 out of 10 infrastructure projects go over, or mega project. Uh, budgets go over budget, and um, that's a fellow named Flyberg who's fascinating in terms of his studies on mega projects. He says mega projects are systematically subject to survival of the unfittest, which explains why the worst projects get built rather than the best. So good governance, he says, is the, probably is the most important remedy to the situation. Uh, there are tremendously powerful corporations interested in these infrastructure projects. They have a lot of money to throw at lobbying activities. They can easily set up local offices. <coughs> they can throw money at local media. These powerful corporations know how to work the system. They conveniently often have other former employees working in civic governments. One of David Broadland's recent articles addressed this in relationship to the uh, sewage treatment plant. Plan. There are tremendous, um, another thing that's sort of working against us is that there's tremendous changes in the media that were once relied on to do the occasional, at least, in-depth investigative report. Advertising revenues which have been relied on by traditional media to fund such investigations um, have dramatically plummeted over the past six years. So these media have often chosen to just abandon that and um, concentrate on more business-friendly, easier things. 
and we can talk about that more later. So all these forces make it important for citizens to get involved themselves in some ways in safeguarding transparency, even if it's just supporting the work of those active on the front lines. And the good news is, as you see, that there are organizations that are represented here and others who are working in various ways to keep the community informed about civic governance issues in a deep and meaningful way. And it isn't that hard either for you to learn how to do, or to do, you know, it's not even a matter of learning almost, to do freedom of information requests if you sense that there's something that should be found out. Um, and I, we can talk about more how to do that later. Um, this, these things will help uh, exercise those transparency muscles that we need to ensure the democratic um, society. So I'll end on an upbeat note. Back in 20, uh, 2012, uh, we actually quoted David Flaherty in a story about the bridge when the uh, city section 43 us. Um, he said, if you're planning to spend a hundred million on something, on something, I need the bridge, you better fund the FOI regime to be able to handle the access requests. Otherwise, it's undemocratic and inappropriate. Well, I'm happy to report that nine months ago, <laughs> it took a while, but um, the city um, actually did get serious about the FOI regime, and they hired somebody who's totally dedicated to answering freedom of information requests. Um, so, in the past, it had been somebody doing it off the side of their desk. Uh, I think she handled um, license, um, uh, liquor license requests and, um, and protocols. So, so now she's freed up to do those jobs properly and we have a, an information access and privacy analyst who David says is great to deal with very professional and efficient. So I believe that our diligent, regular use of FOI forced the city to regularly flex its muscles for transparency and accountability, along with other people who were doing that too, and they got stronger muscles. So positive change is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, very much. Great information there. Matt, you're next up. Matt Wright, Press Secretary to um, Andrew Weaver, MLA for, I oh, won't forget, MLA for Oak Bay Gordon Head, and the only member, only member of the Green Party sitting in, sitting in the provincial BC House. Matt? Thank you very much, Christopher. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, quick question for you. Uh, under the provincial legislation, David, you could be quiet here. Um, there are two kinds of people, receptors within the uh, FOI Act, who are exempt from any kind of freedom of information requests. So, does anybody know who they are? They're not actually exempt, cabinet. They, you can you can FOI them for certain uh, certain aspects of information. It's actually legislative staff and judges. You can't FOI a judge, and actually you can't FOI me because I'm legislative staff or Andrew Weaver. That'll be changed. <laughs> <laughs> so the the only difference about that coming out of an MLA's office, either the constituency or the legislative office, is uh, there'll be new rules coming up around this as well as is around expense and budget disclosure. Uh, which has been, as many of you may be aware, in the news lately, especially with the speaker's muffin rat. Coincidentally, and uh, rather timely, last week we had a technical briefing with the um, Minister of Technology and Innovation, uh, it's Andrew Wilkinson's office, and they are the ministries actually in charge, they're basically the clearinghouse for provincial FOIs. They have over 120 people working full-time on that alone. So it's a massive budget. In fact, it's the, within the ministry staff, it's, it's their largest sector that he has to deal with. And I have some stats for you, because I find the stats really interesting, and it ties into what Leslie was talking about a little bit with David was as well. Uh, the number of FOIs that were received by um, the province overall, this goes from 2009 all the way up to uh, the middle of this 